So I'd like to introduce Dr. Rob Rixey, those who are uh, part of our community and uh, uh, especially part of the fellowship program know uh, Rob very well. He's uh, uh, one of our eminent uh, geriatricians here in the um, in, in the region for gosh, 20, mm -hmm. 20 a while. Yes. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have him not only as a lecturer, but also as a instructor for uh, our geriatric rotation. Uh, a lot of a lot of people learned a lot from Rob. So uh, with that, uh, I'll just turn it over to you, Rob, and uh, take it away. Sure. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, going to present quite a bit of information about dementia. Um, we've all experienced dementia either um, personally or clinically working with the older individuals. Um, and we'll just go ahead and start with the first slide here. Let's see, I have no conflicts of interest. Um, dementia, uh, again, I'm, there's quite a bit of information I want to present here. Uh, first, I want to kind of define what dementia is. Uh, what are the categories of dementia? different characteristics of dementia. Um, we'll talk a lot about behavioral issues related to dementia, and that sometimes is the, one of the more challenging aspects of treating a person with dementia. Um, we'll talk uh, kind of briefly about treatment perspectives of dementia. That's often kind of a talk in of itself. And then uh, we'll focus a lot on caregiver-related issues with dementia. And then finally, um, some end of life uh, issues that uh, we deal with, with folks who have dementia. Um, our population is aging. Um, the proportion of those above the age of 65 back in 2018 was about 60, 16 percent. Um, 2025 is estimated to be about 19 percent. And in 2030, it's estimated that, uh, one in five Americans are, are, um, uh, are going to be above the age of 65. Um, our uh, population above the age of 85 is our fastest growing segment of the population. Back in 2018, uh, there were uh, six and a half million individuals above the age of 85 in 2030, it's estimated uh, about 9 million in 2050, uh, close to 20 million, that's hard to believe, right? So 5% of our total population, that's not too far away, 25, 25 years from now. Um, what is dementia? Uh, dementia is an umbrella term applied to many disorders. And I often get asked that, what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Um, dementia encompasses all the different diseases uh, related to memory loss. The newer term is called neurocognitive disorder. Um, in DSM, uh, the fifth edition now, uh, again, dementia is termed, the ma is termed major neurocognitive disorder. Um, general dementia refers to several disorders that cause significant decline in one or more areas of cognitive function severe enough to result in functional de decline. And that's the key is that functional decline. It's not an inherent aspect of aging. It is different from normal cognitive lapses. We all get the normal we can't remember, um, but it's oftentimes we can't remember that we can't remember is the more the concerning. And it's progressive and disabling. Um, Again, it's acquired impairment of memory and other cognitive domains sufficient to affect daily life. Um, can be caused by any disorder resulting in structural damage to brain systems involved in memory. And Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common disorder causing the dementia syndrome in, in later life. Uh, this is a, somewhat of a busy slide, but I meant it to be, be busy. Um, um, on the top is Alzheimer's disease. That's the most common cause of dementia. Uh, uh, next, uh, we have vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies. It's thought that dementia with Lewy bodies is probably the second most common neurocognitive uh, neurodegenerative disorder of dementia. And we have Parkinson's disease with dementia, which is kind of the cousin with dementia with Lewy bodies. We have frontal temporal dementia. Alcoholic dementia, post hypoxic dementia, uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. A person has uh, urinary incontinence, uh, dementia, and gait instability. Um, then we have some metabolic uh, issues related can re be related to dementia. That's part of my workup that I generally do when I, I see an individual individual that's newly diagnosed with dementia is to get that TSH and that B12 level just to make sure that you have replaced that as best as possible. And then. Delirium that can masquerade as, as dementia, um, and then uh, same with de depression. There's many others. Uh, so there's more than 60 different diseases that uh, present with dementia. 
Um, fewer than half of people and their caregivers with, with Alzheimer's disease have been told of their diagnosis by their healthcare provider. Um, and it can be very distressing uh, when you convey the diagnosis, um, but it has been shown that it doesn't increase the risk for suicide per se. But it is important to, to be upfront, to be transparent, and health care professionals have that professional, ethical, and uh, sometimes legal obligation to disclose the diagnosis of, of dementia. Uh, In terms of epidemiology, um, it typically it's a disease of later life, generally beginning after the age of 65. And again, Alzheimer's disease is our most common cause of dementia. About two thirds of all dementia cases are, are, are Alzheimer's disease and it affects about six to 8% of older adults in general. Again, the most frequent cause of irreversible dementia in older adults. Prevalence doubles every five years after the age of 60. And some studies suggest that up to 45% of those above the age of 85 have some form of dementia, maybe mild, but um, that's kind of a staggering account as you think back to that earlier slide where how many individuals are gonna be above the age of 85. And it's thought that vascular dementia causes an estimated 15 to 20% of cases and often coexists with Alzheimer's disease in terms of mixed dementia. Um, I did my fellowship back um, a, a few years ago at University of Washington and did a lot of research looking at dementia and uh, looking at uh, um, uh, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. And oftentimes it's a, a kind of a coexistence of the two that um, you see. Uh, Rob, if I could just uh, interpose a question, and you may address this later on, but, but you use the word staggering, and I would agree, for up to 45% of those age 85 plus have some element of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, so that really gets into the, the etiology issue of it. Uh, if you're gonna talk about that, you don't have to answer the question okay. now, but, mm -hmm. but, but it just makes me wonder, is, are, that almost suggests that, that it's to be expected as a normal process of aging that some element of Alzheimer's is gonna creep into life. And I think that, that when you take a look at um, all the efforts that are being done to try to prevent it, Right. If it's inevitable, you know, are, are those of value? So anyway. Yeah, no, that, um, that, that's a great, I don't address that. So that's a great question. Um, there's so much to talk about with dementia, um, but that kind of goes along with your vascular risk factors. Um, in terms of it's most important and um, goes back to the Honolulu Asia Aging Study, and that was out of um, Hawaii several years ago. And it's an ongoing study, and they looked at several risk factors of why does a person develop dementia? And this is particularly um, focused on those vascular risk factors. Um, we thought that, you know, I think definitely we can see how it affects in the, the developing uh, uh, vascular dementia, but it's also been shown that it can develop Alzheimer's disease. So it's important to control your cholesterol levels, your hypertension um, issues, et, et cetera. And it's been shown to, to control those most in midlife too. Once you get dementia, kind of the horse is out of the gate basically. And uh, it's, it's, that's where the studies have been most popular. You know, most important to show that if we can control those vascular risk factors in midlife. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Um, and uh, finally, the dementia with Lewy bodies is increasing in prevalence. And it seems like that's kind of a newer entity. It was at least a kind of a newer diagnosis, but I was a fellow 20 years ago. Um, uh, but it's determined to be the second most common cause of, of dementia in people over the age of 65. Some other statistics, uh, 5 million people in the United States have developed some intellectual impairment and it's, the cost is, is staggering too. Um, uh, uh, more than $240 billion uh, back in 2019. Um, there, uh, in terms of some other costs, $818 billion are spent annually for direct costs of medical and social care and informal care. And that represents 1.1% of the gross domestic product. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance provide much of the direct costs, uh, though a lot of the remaining costs are covered by families and their caregivers. And oftentimes that's an indirect cost that's not easily calculated in terms of uh, caregiving time that's spent away from uh, work, et cetera. And it can be an uh, emotional cost, uh, direct toll on the patients, but also on, on caregivers. Nearly half of caregivers suffer uh, some psychological distress, especially uh, depression. And um, half more, uh, half 
uh, have more physical health issues. And um, one uh, statistic uh, that I came across, 35% of caregivers, uh, patients with dementia report that their health has worsened due to care relationships compared to 19% of caregivers of older adults without dementia. So that's kind of an important aspect as well. I thought it'd be just kind of important, back to our gross anatomy days, uh, this is a chrono section of the brain. On the left is a normal brain, and on the right, I don't know if I have a clicker here. Yeah, so um, as, as you can see, the ventricles are very uh, large, um, uh, sauci are widened, gyri are normal, are, are, are narrowed, um, hippocampi are, are very, uh, almost non-existent in a, a person with dementia. And this is an example of a person with, with Alzheimer's disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease was diagnosed um, more than 100 years ago. Alois Alzheimer's was the first uh, kind of psychiatrist that uh, um, diagnosed Alzheimer's disease. And this is a, a picture on the, uh, on the left is a picture of, of, of Dr. Alzheimer. And then on the, a picture on the um, right is uh, Auguste Dieter, uh, or Auguste D that she's often known as. And she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in her later 40s, uh, uh, late early 50s. Um, she lived between 1850 and 1906, um, and again, she was the first person diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, she became ill around the age of 50, and she be began to experience memory loss, uh, delusions, um, almost became a, a kind of a vegetative state. Um, she eventually passed away at age 55, so it was um, pretty early. She would be classified as uh, pre uh dementia, per se. Um, and it wasn't until 1910 that the first diagnosis or first use of the word Alzheimer's disease uh, came to be used. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, just briefly, uh, some of the other causes uh, for dementia, um, generally as a whole, um, it's a result of accumulation of proteins or protein aggregates within the, within the brain that set off a cascade of events affecting neuronal function and cell death in a disease-specific pattern. In Alzheimer's disease, uh, we have those amyloid plaques and uh, the tau neurofibrillary tangles, so the plaques and tangles. In Lewy body and Parkinson's dementia, we have your cytoplasmic alpha synuclein and inclusion bodies and frontotemporal dementia are, are tau or ubiquitin, ubiquitin proteins. And this is a kind of a microscopic slide. We have our smudge state, that's our plaques, and then um, our tangles uh, represent the, the, the tear draped kind of shaped cells or, or, or represent our neurofibrillary tangles. Alzheimer's disease, the, it can be diagnosed the vast majority um, clinically. Um, uh, we become more adapt and using more advanced technology such as PET scanning. But still, it's generally um, in the day-to-day, -day, it's a clinical diagnosis. Um, it's an insidious onset of progressive memory and executive impairment in a clear state of consciousness in later life um, as, as, as Alzheimer's disease. And this slide represents another graph of uh, projected prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. Our green graph are those between the ages 65 to 74. And as you can see, it's, it's um, ever-increasing about more than 1 million folks in 2050 will have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but that blue graph is kind of what, um, I don't know if it scares me, but just becomes, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a significant factor. And that, that's our population above the age of 85. More than 5 million folks we're gonna, are going to have um, Alzheimer's disease. In terms of a more definitive diagnosis, um, Alzheimer's disease is characterized by a decline in memory and learning. This is from DSM-5, the revised edition. Um, there are other cognitive domains that are affected. This includes complex attention, our ability to multitask, um, our executive functional skills, ability to plan, organize, make decisions, um, ability to learn or recall. And this is generally the hallmark of, of Alzheimer's disease. You know, we have uh, language or, or verbal fluency issues, either expressive or receptive, um, perceptual motor control, understanding what one is able to see, the ability to use a hairbrush. You and I, even with our eyes closed, if we were given a you know a hairbrush, we'd know exactly how to use it. Those folks with dementia do not know how to use, um, would, would know how to use something like that. They develop apraxia. And social cognition, less of a filter, um, that can be particularly seen in frontal te temporal dementia, but you can also have like frontal variants of Alzheimer's disease as well. 
And it's an interference with activity of daily living um, due to decline in these cognitive functions. Um, if you rotate through with me, I'll, we often talk, talk about the A's of Alzheimer's disease. And um, there are five in particular that I, I, I kind of keep in mind. Um, agnosia, the inability, or inter the, the inability to interpret sensations and, and, and to recognize items. So you can't recognize familiar objects or faces, for example. Um, anomia, the inability to recall the name of everyday objects. Aphasia, um, impaired expression and understanding the language, again, either expressive or receptive. Apraxia, uh, inability to perform purposeful movements. You have that motor skill still intact, but there's a disconnect between the, in the, the brain and the limb, per se. Um, and amnesia, that's certainly the hallmark, uh, uh, including memory loss. Next, we'll focus on behavioral issues related to dementia. Um, and I, I think it's important to focus on this because if, if you can um, make the meaning out of behavior, this can alleviate a lot of anxiety and suffering. And definitely uh, classify these, as, at least I do, as the ABCs. Um, and these are all interrelated activities of daily living, behavior, and cognition. Um, Behavior disturbances related to dementia fall into three groups, and these overlap, including uh, mood symptoms, excuse me, um, psychosis, behavior, specific behavior problems. And it's thought, of, you know, if the disturbance is polysymptomatic, uh, one approach is to target treatment to that prevailing feature. Um, so to focus on, you know, if it's related more to, to psychosis, uh, mood symptoms, uh, aggression, or behavioral disruption. Um, Alzheimer's disease, when it follows its typical course, can last, you know, more than 10 years. We have our early stage, middle stage, advanced stage. Um, as you can see here, memory losses encompasses all. What I think is more important is that um, my psychosis and the disruptive uh, behavior type issues, that, that develops more as, as a person for, uh, progresses with their disease process. And as many as 80 to 90 percent of patients with dementia uh, develop at least one distressing symptom over the course of the illness. Uh, behavior disturbances or psychotic symptoms in dementia often precipitate that, precipitate that early nursing home placement. Um, the behavior disturbances are potentially treatable, so it's vital to anticipate and recognize them early. Some other common clinical uh, features we talked about a little bit about the A's, but we also have other A's, anxiety, apathy, depression, um, appetite changes, irritability, um, uh, verbal disruptions. Um, psychiatric symptoms can develop and resemble discrete mental disorders, such as depression or mania again. Um, and neuropsychiatric symptoms, such as apathy, poor self-care, paranoia, may be the first indication that a person's developing dementia. In terms of agitation, um, this reflects the loss of ability to, to modulate behavior in a socially acceptable way. Um, and I'll, I'll, I often get you know, a little bit anxious when a nurse calls me and says a person's agitated. agitated. Well, what does that mean? Um, the term agitation is, is, is commonly used, but it's very nonspecific. Um, I try to you know, probe more uh, what is going on with that individual. Um, it's important to include a careful description of the nature of the symptom when it occurs, where it develops, and any precipitants that are identified. Examples can include verbal outbursts, physical aggression, resistance to bathing or other care needs, and restless motor activities such as pacing or, or rocking. Um, it often occurs concomitantly with other, other psychotic symptoms such as paranoia, delusional thinking, or hallucinations. And resistance to care can, often, can, can be seen, and that often occurs uh, in those later stages of dementia, you know, when the person's generally maybe in the nursing home setting per se. But it can be the first sign of an, an incipient cognitive decline. Some other uh, issues to keep in mind are, you know, maybe it's a medical issue that is developing. Um, if, it, there's, if there's a disturbance that's new, acute and onset or evolving, that generally can be, it may be due to a medical condition or medication toxicity. And isolated behavioral disturbance can be the sole presenting symptom of a, a 
urinary tract infection, gouty flare-up, uh, electrolyte abnormality, et cetera. Um, I've seen po folks with constipation, um, you know, that can be easily treatable. Um, uh, medication intolerance or toxicity, or maybe a um, need for a uh, basic need, you know, maybe the person's hungry, uh, maybe they're thirsty, um, they're sl or sleepy. None of us are at our best when, they're, when we're sleepy. Um, so those are all factors uh, that can be in play. Um, other behavioral symptoms, and um, this may be more disease specific, but in frontotemporal dementia, it's often associated with uh, prominent disinhibition, uh, those compulsive behaviors, social impairment, uh, generally it occurs in folks who are younger, um, uh, but in frontotemporal dementia, uh, you can include hyperphagia, hyperactivity, hypersexuality, um, and in dementia with Lewy bodies, it's prominent with psychosis and often characterized by visual hallucinations. In, ter back in, ter in terms of behavioral symptoms, um, a person's feelings definitely can affect their behavior. Uh, a person may feel lost, worried, anxious, vulnerable, helpless. Um, those can all aggravate uh, behavioral issues. Um, when a person has uh, mild dementia, they may be aware uh, that they're, they're failing, and that definitely can um, makes them anxious, and uh, especially the caregivers anxious. And a person may feel that they're making a fool of themselves, et cetera. Um, in terms of those catastrophic behavioral symptoms, um, uh, there are different so, so, some triggers uh, for those, and those are those behavior symptoms that are catastrophic are the ones that we re we remember. Um, but there can be triggers. You know, a person with dementia um, uh, has difficult thinking of, of several items at, at once, um, trying to do something that they can no longer manage, uh, being cared for by someone who is rushed or upset, um, not wanting to appear inadequate, uh, being hurried, um, not understanding what they were asked to do, and then finally not understanding what they saw or heard. Um, so a uh, person with dementia, they often, you know, are, are elderly, and so they often have difficulty hearing, difficulty seeing, so those sensory senses can all uh, affect um, behavioral issues as well. Um, other triggers for catastrophic behavioral symptoms include being tired, not feeling well, not being able to make themselves understood, being frustrated, being treated like a child, feeling sick and not knowing why. Um, one resource that's very helpful is the 36 hour day and um, we'll talk about that in just a, a, a bit but in this uh, outline um, the six hours of behavioral management the ability to you know if you should restrict stop the person what they're doing especially if it may be um, unsafe um, reassess consider physical illness or medication as a as a cause Reconsider, uh, consider a point of view from, you know, from the person with dementia. Rechannel, uh, consider a safe and destructive avenue, you know, uh, again, probably go back to restrict, but kind of if you can channel that person to do something, maybe they're, they're doing something unsafe, but maybe can uh, use that uh, avenue and have that person to do something that's uh, not unsafe. Um, and reassure, um, you know, if you can speak to the individual with a calm and um, pleasant voice, uh, things are going to be okay. That often does the trick per se. Um, in review, after that catastrophic uh, behavior issue happened, think over what just happened and see if there's something that could be adjusted to and prevented from it happening again. In terms of the treatment perspectives of dementia, there are several different resources. Um, uh, that can be utilized uh, to help care for an individual with dementia. Um, uh, Jerry Trishan, that's your primary care physician, often the quarterback in management. I'm always hoping that we have more geriatricians. Uh, there are not enough geriatricians in this world. Um, that's why we often include other uh, learners that rotate with me. Um, uh, oftentimes, if you're out in practice, uh, such as a family medicine or internal medicine doc, you're gonna see and be, and be that primary care physician. Um, can be helpful to have a geriatric psychiatrist on board, a neurologist on board, 
a neuropsychologist on board, uh, especially in early uh, um, identification to, to do that uh, detailed testing with, you know, it may take a half a day, but it can get a lot of good useful information from that overall uh, uh, review. Social worker can be very helpful. Um, physical therapist, occupational therapist, recreational therapist, mental health, home care. Uh, that's all part of home care services. Is, um, if a person is considered homebound, they're eligible for all those home care services. Um, nurse and pharmacist are, are, all, are, are all helpful. Uh, we have a memory disorders clinic. Most hospitals now have a memory disorders. One of the first in West Michigan was our memory disorders clinic um, at St. Mary's um, with Dr. Kevin Foley. Um, and I think, Joel, you're involved with that as well. Yeah. It's been, you know, so that can be very helpful. They do that overall assessment. Um, other resources in, in, in terms of treating a person with dementia is including a, an attorney to, to help with maybe estate planning, a community, including neighbors and friends, organizations, including the Alzheimer's Association, the area agencies and aging, um, and, um, and as well as other services, including Meals on Wheels and those senior citizen centers. Talked earlier, um, one of the more helpful resources is the uh, 36 hour day. And I brought in a, an example, um, pass that around. Um, this is the caregiving guide that's been out for more than 40 years. It began in back in the 1980s. Um, editors are Nancy Mace and Peter Evans and they're uh, psychiatrists out of Johns Hopkins. And it's, um, uh, it's been a, the leading book for cover, coverage for caregivers for those for, for dementia. And the ideas in the book generally were generated from folks with um, caregivers of folks with dementia. Um, so I encourage you to, to read it. It's a pretty easy, simple read, and um, I think it'd be helpful to um, hand it out, you know, or at least pass on the name to um, uh, caregivers for, uh, for those with dementia. And in terms of other dementia, in terms of treatment, it's important to manage the cognitive, behavioral, and psychosocial issues, enhance quality of life, maximize functional performance, um, recognize acute changes and factors that may contribute to those behavioral changes. Um, it's important to educate the caregiver. Um, caregiver education and support interventions reduce distress and delay the need for nursing home placement. Strength of evidence is an A. Um, uh, behavior disturbances may decrease with music, particularly during meals and bathing. Um, light physical exercise, such as walking, has been shown to be very helpful to minimize behavior disturbances. Address underlying precipitants related to medical conditions, including environment, caregiver, and basic needs. Um, and use behavioral interventions and consider medications only if disturbances persist despite best efforts at addressing the bug. And that was kind of a, a theme when I, when I read through the 36-hour uh, book. Um, they rarely mention medications and that, that we often get the call from the nursing staff to like, what can you prescribe? Oftentimes, this may be a behavioral adjustment that can be maybe the best uh, way to adjust uh, and treat that individual with experiencing uh, behavioral issues. Sometimes you're stuck and need some, a medication to, to treat a behavioral issue. But uh, oftentimes those non-pharmacological approaches may be the, your, your best and uh, first step. Um, other, again, non-pharmacological management in terms of cognitive uh, training, um, supportive individual and group therapy, physical and mental activity, again, family and caregiver education support, safety monitoring, uh, oversight of your ADLs, your activities of daily living, and well as your instrumental activities of daily living. Um, you know, it's important to manage wandering, uh, may uh, need the person to retire from driving, et cetera. Um, some other non-pharmacological issues, uh, supportive strategies that can be helpful include use of clocks, calendars, maybe early on, um, later on um, when they have advanced dementia, um, you, it's probably best just to live in the moment of that person with dementia and not try to re keep reorienting that individual. Um, um, and also the st structure activities to match patient abilities. Um, Again, uh, let's see, did I go backwards? I'm just going to, the last one about the environmental yeah. management is, is always fascinating to me. I was called a few years ago to, to see uh, someone at the local nursing home, uh, and the patient had been pretty much stable for years uh, with a fairly significant uh, Alzheimer's dementia, just a very slowly progressive. 
and in one day fell off the rails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and this has been going for several days and the, you know, the medical director of the nursing home uh, uh, had, you know, given, you know, prescribed medications, which didn't help. And they, so they asked if I would come in. Uh, and the only trigger was that they had simply moved her to a different room. Mm -hmm. And so I said, can't we just move her back to the previous <laughs> room? Which they did, and it went away. Yeah, and and it, it, it to me was just a a, a fascinating reminder of, uh, of the role that environment plays in that. Right, right, and yeah, there's um, again that non pharmacological approach, basically, right? In, yeah. in terms of you know, I'm throwing out of that individual a, a, a simple change back to the to an environment that the person was used to and familiar with. Um, I remember a story where person was uh, really agitated during the night, was up most of the night. Um, they went back and looked at his, you know, behavior, his occupation. Uh, he was a third night shift worker. And so his typical pattern was sleeping during the day and up during the night. So you're not going to change that after 30 years. And so this, the nursing staff was all concerned. He's not sleeping during the night. Well, that's not his normal pattern. Right. <laughs> no, so that was exactly my mom. I, I would get a call. She's out wandering in the you know, nursing station at midnight. And mm -hmm. I said, well, that's when she was practicing the piano when she was that's right. younger. <laughs> she slept in and yep. stayed up late. So exactly. Yeah. Yep. You can probably kind of read through some of this on your own, though. Again, treating those underlying medical conditions, assessing for new medical problems. Make sure you have those hearing aids and eyeglasses, dentures in place for sick particularly. Um, attend to patient's sleep and eating patterns with what's normal for them. Install safety, safety measures to prevent accidents. Um, ensure that the caregiver is adequate respite. Uh, educate givers, caregivers about practical aspects of dementia care and about behavior disturbances. Teach caregivers communication skills, how to avoid confrontation. Um, again, techniques of ADL support, activities to dementia care. Uh, increase socialization with one-to-one -one visits. And use our technology that we have available, such as smartphone, um, can be very helpful. Um, simplifying bathing and dressing with the use of adaptive clothing and assistive devices if needed. Offer toileting frequently and anticipating condoms as dementia progresses. Increase daytime activity level with physical exercise, ambulation, dance, and other movement activities. Uh, again, provide that sensory has enhancement, soothing interventions um, with pet therapy, uh, hand massage, aromatherapy, individualized music and art. Provide access to experienced professionals and community, community resources, including charity care, care managers and recreational therapists. Um, I only included one slide on pharmaco pharmacology, but um, these can be helpful as well. Uh, again, this is a whole separate talk, but we have the arcolinesterase inhibitors, memantine, monoclonal antibodies. That's kind of the, the wave of the future. Um, the Kembe is probably the the, the one that's. Um, most encouraging, um, aducanumab is the one that had the most, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, um, there wasn't a lot of support for use of that one, but the Kemby is our, our newest monoclonal antibody that became available. But those are very expensive. We're talking thousands of dollars and they're not really clinically feasible. I haven't used them myself. I, I don't know if the Alzheimer's is well, they, better they at all. They can reduce tau and they've, they've right. done a good job of doing that. But a lot of that conversation is how soon should we start it? Right. I mean, there's talk about even starting it decades ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Because at this point, by the time we recognize, like you said, the, the horse is out of the gate. Yeah. It's kind of, we, we can't really backtrack, even if we can remove a protein. The day right. Is, which, which is a question I have. My, my experience with Alzheimer's meds is that nothing reverses a process. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get back what you've lost. Mm -hmm. And and all they can potentially do is extend life. And and the I think that the for me the the ethical question is what level of quality of life are we extending? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And 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 how can is that even a measurable thing? I mean, does it say that yeah that they live X number of months longer on this drug with a progressive neurologic disease? My my question is so what? Mm -hmm. at, at the risk of cerebral edema and hydrocephalus. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, last part, we'll focus on some caregiving related issues with dementia. Um, this is a helpful video from Holland Home regarding, called the Dementia Journey. And let's see if I click on here. Um, 
And I thought this was very helpful. It's about a seven minute video, but I'd like to have you all watch this. Dementia is, it's embarrassing, overwhelmed, hopeless. That can that's trigger. Angry. Dementia is very pervasive. In Kent County alone, there are 100,000 people diagnosed with dementia. We were there the weekend that it kind of came to the uh, forefront where she needed to be placed somewhere. We walked in the house. The stove was a uh, thing in the pan. It was burning. This resident is going to be um, looking for her mother tonight. And she may not want to go to sleep until her mother comes in. So you need to reassure her that she'll be in and she'll come in and see her before she goes when she gets in. If you can get her in bed, then she'll go to sleep. We go at the same time and we sit at the same table and she orders the same food. She taught me many things. She taught me how to stand up straight, to walk straight, to have good manners, to do all those things that grandmothers did with you, taught you to bake, taught you to do all those things, have the emotional connection. And that's what I really miss because she could read my face and she knew me very well. If you can get in front of him and say his name and actually get him to, to look into your eye and acknowledge that you're there. Then, then he'll listen to you. Have to break people, just lose the basic functions. Yeah. No. We need to start cutting carbs. I need to draw myself. Physically. Wow. Yes. Start it's wonderful to be able to find myself in the future and know that he loves me. You might think it's going to be a good thing. 60 seconds. Watch this. Hang on just a second. All right. I just kind of kind of messed this up. You're over 40 and running on the treadmill and it's lazy. Stop listening. It's not easy. It's easy. Yeah, it's easy. Dementia is very pervasive. So the dementia journey alone is on everything else and in a way people where we can actually put on the senses of those who are going to dementia. Hang on one second. Be present with them where they need us to be. I don't know of anybody who would not benefit from going through an experience like this. We created our glasses and the inserts in the feet and our gloves. We bought our own headsets and we created iPods with the ambient noise. Well, the dementia journey that I just went through, which simulates a, a real life um, situation, was unbelievable. It, um, to have your eyesight diminished, your touch, your feel, your senses, your hearing, um, that's what these people, I'm, I'm sure, feel like every day. I did not complete all the tests. My sight was restricted when I was going through the journey. Most frustrating mm -hmm. loss of sense for me was sight. Closet, having to move my head around, trying to figure out what sweater is what, what what's a towel look like. I was not able to fold clothes, tactile stimulation. I couldn't feel my fingertips and where the towel was in relation to me. Just doing simple tasks is frustrating. It's embarrassing. You can't find your way around. You don't remember the tasks in order. You don't know where to find the things you're supposed to be finding. And you know, you know my touch was off with those gloves on. And obviously, I couldn't even feel if I was writing correctly. I had a cognizant mind and I had executive function intact when I went into the journey. And I felt like it was stripped away from me. And as I went to, from one task to the next, I felt like I need to succeed. I need to get all of these things done, and then I will be a success. And there was a real sense of loneliness. The dementia jury program is important in that it can teach our caregivers 
how to better serve the community of residents that we take care of. So I realize when I'm approaching residents, I need to be coming at them from a forward position and getting down to their level so I can make eye contact. I've learned through this experience that um, it's really important to put yourself in people's shoes. And for sure, those people who deal with this on a daily basis, I read all the textbooks and I looked at all the, the case studies and the films and, and uh, I thought I had a really good understanding of uh, uh, what it was to care for someone or to have dementia. But really, you don't know what that's like until you actually care for someone with dementia. And um, going through the dementia journey was um, really invaluable. Moving forward, I think that, you know, as much as I can try to make our environment feel comfortable and safe and make as few demands on her as possible, and just, you know, joke around and have fun and love her and don't put her in a situation that makes her too challenged. The goal is to train every single staff member that works with them how long home in the dementia journey. We have approximately 1,200 employees. That's a lot of people to get through a journey like this, but we want everybody that can come in contact with a patient or a resident, understand what dementia is about and to the best of their ability. And that may take follow-up from our educators to actually be on the units with them to help guide them and give them the confidence they need to say, okay, I can try this. I can do a different approach and it actually works. If I ever were to have dementia, if you're going to take care of me, I would say just keep it very simple. Approach me calmly and quietly and touch my hand to let me know that you're there. Don't expect too much. Just joke with me. Just keep me safe and help me feel safe. And just love me. So the dementia journey is an uh, um, experience that all new employees at Holland Home go through um, uh, when they first start working at Holland Home. Holland Home is a continuing care retirement community in, in Grand Rapids, includes uh, Breton and Raybrook campus, and that's primarily where I work at. Um, let's see, Joe, how do I get back to her, John? I'll be great. We should try to try clicking. Yeah. Okay. And so it was, um, I, when I went through this, it was kind of a eye opening type experience. Um, you go through it with about, um, half a dozen other individuals. Um, again, they're all new employees. Um, remember one person saying, I feel like I have dementia after experiencing that. So, um, you know, they put the goggles on where you can't really see the earmuffs on, so you can't really hear and gloves sewn, so you can't really pick up items very well. I can only imagine trying to text. You know, on the phone where that where the gloves on per se, um, it can be um, overstimulating and anxiety provoking. Just uh, kind of going through through that, and then you can only imagine where the where the person who has dementia, uh, how that can provoke uh, you know those those uh, behavioral issues per se. Um, in terms of caregiving, um, caregiving is the experience of providing physical and emotional care to another person. Um, in the U.S. term caregiver. Uh, refers to a person providing any type of care informally and without financial compensation. People who provide informally may not think of, of themselves as caregivers, and older adults receiving care may not identify themselves as care recipients, and they may be simultaneously providing care to another person. Uh, it's oftentimes a, a person's in uh, you know, called the sandwich generation, where they're taking care of the older adult as well as maybe children at home, per se. Um, in terms of caregiver statistics, um, one out of every five American adults provide care in a given year. Uh, about 14% of all American adults provide care to someone above the age of 50. And about half of them feel that they have no choice but to do so. Um, women comprise the majority of caregivers. Um, uh, most are older, 35% uh, of caregivers are 50 to 74 years of, old, of age, but um, more than 50% are younger. Uh, in age uh, who are caregiving. Um, and majority of caregiving comes from family members. Uh, in fact, 75 to 80%, 85% of all care is provided by a family. 15% um, of caregivers support unrelated individual. 
Uh, about 25% of caregivers have been caring for more than five years, and some have been caregiving for more than 10 years. 18% uh, of caregivers report being highly strained financially, and about 25% of all caregivers had difficulty obtaining local affordable care uh, services. Compared to 2015, there has been a greater proportion of caregiver adults providing care to multiple people. Um, uh, now 24% are caring for two or more recipients, and that's up from 18% just a few years ago. Employment status varies widely among caregivers, regardless of age, and caregivers don't, don't disclose their role to supervisors and commonly rely on those flexible hours. And so there's a lot going on at home, you can say. Uh, costs of caregiving, the costs of informal caregiving uh, represented by wages have been reported to be more than $500 billion annually. Again, that's a staggering amount. Uh, significant concerns for individual caregivers and families. There's a higher societal reliance on unpaid care. Uh, costs of replacing care with professional services estimated to be almost close to a trillion dollars, um, more than $200 for unskilled care and more than $600 billion for skilled care services. Um, Rob, have you ever done a comparative study on uh, how the different healthcare structures in different countries uh, impact the care of people with dementia? Uh, you know, when we look at uh, universal health uh, coverage uh, areas, you know, pick any other industrialized country other than the United States, yeah. you know, uh, that, that provides universal coverage for, uh, for resources. Does that impact the care of dementia? Have you ever had a chance to study that, look at that? I haven't personally, but, you know, in terms of, I guess, culturally how it's set up per se, um, some, you know, other countries um, just take care of that individual at home throughout all stages of life per se. And are given support to be able mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, 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 that's the key, right? That's the key, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, some caregiving general suggestions, um, you know, keep that caregiver informed. Share the concerns with the person with dementia, if that dementia is still mild. Um, uh, try to solve your most frustrating problems one at a time. Uh, get enough rest. Uh, use common sense and imagination. Uh, it's important to maintain a sense of humor. Um, we all get frustrated, but it's important, I think, to still keep that sense of humor, per se. Um, other, some caregiving tips, try to establish an environment that allows as much freedom as possible, but also provides that structure that people with dementia so in need. Uh, remember to talk to the person directly. As we age, we lose our peripheral vision, and with dementia, it's been shown that a uh, person with dementia even loses peripheral vision even more. Uh, so it's important to, to be kind of more face-to-face face -face with that individual. Um, have an ID bracelet made, um, a wear, wear, uh, wearable tracking device. You know, those are commonly used now. Um, keep the person active but not upset. Um, caregivers report physical, emotional, financial strain, uh, or two in re 10 reporting feeling alone. Um, when compared to 2015, fewer, care fewer caregivers report their health status as to be excellent or very good, and that's down even just a few years ago. And a greater proportion report being in fair or poor health, so that all can compound their ability to take a per care of a person adequately. It's important to assess the caregiver um, themselves. Um, caregivers often benefit from conversations that simultaneously screen for distress and assess their needs. Um, they may be, uh, you know, handled in a, a doctor's visit, basically. Sometimes I, I'm talking more about the person with dementia if I'm seeing a, a, a loved one, such as the spouse, and how they're dealing with that loved one. Um, and that loved one may be uh, in assisted living in a nursing home setting. Um, um, in terms of, do you provide care to another loved one? Who is, who is the adult? Um, do you feel strained when you're around your loved one? Do you feel you have lost control of your life since you've started providing care for your loved one? And how, how burdened do you feel caring for your loved one? Those are all maybe some questions to keep in mind when you're dealing with the caregiver themselves. There are different caregiving options. Uh, there's community-based care. Um, that's the, the ability to use uh, non-medical community services. And th those are critical in helping adults uh, maintain their independence. Area agencies and aging that stemmed from the Older Adult uh, Americans Act back in the 1960s. Um, those, are, those have been very helpful to coordinate services to maintain a person in their home as long as possible. They're important to participate in advocacy, conduct needs assessments. Maybe there's 
resources that the government can provide that can keep a person in their own home. Uh, they're very helpful in coordinating plan and services to address those needs. In terms of long-term care considerations, uh, why and when is it best for the person to move? Maybe they need that higher level of care. Um, it's important to look at you know different characteristics of, of a nursing home facility. Um, nursing home compare is a very helpful resource um, and that grades uh, the nursing homes in the country. Uh, there's more than 15,000 nursing homes in, in the United States, um, but they all are surveyed just about annually and they all get uh, the five star, you know, the star rating. Some are only two stars. And um, so it's important to see maybe some, there are some better than others. Um, uh, what would uh, moving to a higher level, what would that placement make in a person's life? And cost is, is, is high. Um, uh, um, nursing home care uh, can cost as high as more than $12,000 a month. Um, so you can only imagine if a person's been in nursing facility for a couple of years, how much does that is that costing? Uh, types of living arrangements, again, full-time support in the home, adult foster home or group homes. Uh, there's PACE programs in the area, and that's nationally as well. Continuing care retirement communities where you're taking care of that individual through all the different levels of care. And that's where I work at Highland Home and Beacon Hill. Uh, those are considered continuing care retirement communities. So you have your independent living, assisted living, and nursing home, basically all on the same campus. Um, each of those have to specialized dementia units as well. And then and finally, nursing facility. Um, in terms of assisted living facility, um, uh, those provide um, uh, you know, personal uh, uh, care. Um, they can be characterized by some level of coordination or provision of those personal care services. They provide social activities, uh, health-related services. I, for example, um, make personal calls and, and round at uh, assisted living, that's particularly of Holland Home and Beacon Hill. Um, care is typically transitional and the average length of residency in assisted living is, is two years. Um, but the most common reason for discharge is moving to that nursing home facility. Um, other services provided include housekeeping, meals, assistance with ADLs, and particularly medication management. And uh, some provide support to individuals with cognitive impairment of dementia. Not all, but the ones I uh, serve do. Um, but additional services can be provided, but oftentimes at additional cost. Are assisted living facilities licensed in the state of Michigan? Mm -hmm. Right, they're not, they don't go under a rigorous survey process though by the state, mm -hmm. um, not as rigorous as like nursing home facilities. Okay. Yeah. Um, cost is an issue though too. Cost isn't covered by Medicare. Oftentimes you're, 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 it's out of pocket cost for the, to stay in a nursing, in an assisted living type setting. And as, assisted living um, cost is, is as high as well, more than $4,000 per month. So that adds up quickly as well. Um, in terms of community, continuing care retirement committees, um, there's different financial models um, uh, that's uh, involved in uh, covering the cost of, of, of uh, for folks who are in, um, uh, in uh, those retirement communities. Holland Home always has a end of the year um, get together dinner. Um, I think hundreds of people attend, and it's a big money fundraiser uh, to keep person in 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 Holland Home when they run out of funds per se. But again, funding is largely private. Some facilities have Medicare or Medicaid funded beds for skilled care. And then this is the last slide. Um, it's kind of a talk in itself too into life care. There's important metrics for good quality of life into life care with folks with dementia. Those plan timely planning discussions, you know, you know, the coordination of care, managing hospitalizations. Maybe they haven't been admitted to hospice yet, but they're going back and forth to the hospital. Recognizing the end of life signs, um, provide providing the supportive care, providing effective working relationship for the primary care team, uh, failing staff, and continuing care, especially of that caregiver after the person dies. And then, as we all know, um, you know, who qualifies for hospice in terms of dementia is that person who's dependent on all activities of daily living. They're unable to walk, dress, bathe without assistance, inability to communicate, largely mute. I think the definition, if they speak six words or less, uh, they qualify. Um, but they have to also 
have that to have to have that comorbid medical condition, aspiration pneumonia, UTI, pressure injury stage three or worse, or a weight loss generally 10% over six months. Um, I don't think we have time to go through the cases. Probably can read that on your own. Um, so a couple, a couple of helpful cases, I think, um, to focus on focusing more on that non-pharmacological management of dementia. Um, let's see. This last slide I wanted to show is a caregiver reference binder. Again, some slides at the end that you can review on your own. Either it can be electronically or um, sometimes it can be helpful just to keep it in a binder for the individual. This includes uh, personal data section, the older adult and caregiver's personal information, contact details for the older adults for primary support network, uh, calendar, including uh, up, you know, appointments that are upcoming, uh, medication schedules, um, all about the individual with dementia or all about the caregiver themselves, medication list, um, listing of all the medications that the person is on, um, healthcare contacts, social care contacts. Um, and then this last slide is a bit busy, but I'll let you read that on your own as well. Just some tips in mind, uh, talking to an individual with dementia. Uh, pocket talker can be very helpful. I carry that in my, my case, just in case if I need it to amplify sound for the person with, with dementia. It makes all the difference when a, a person can finally hear you and uh, can better communicate with you. Um, and then uh, references, some of my slides were taken from the church review syllabus, uh, we're up to version 11 that comes out about every uh, three years, um, uh, but it's a very helpful resource for, for geriatric medicine topics in general. So I'll leave it there. Go ahead and uh, stop share. Or I do that. Uh, right tab. That red tab. Red, red, red tab. tab. Uh, gotcha. Great. Uh, wonderful. Well, 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 thanks, Rob. Uh, very, very um, instructive and, and, and helpful here. Um, I will uh, be sending um, a copy of the PowerPoint to the fellows and the program directors and the, those, those on the list that might be interested in, uh, uh, in getting a copy of that who are not fellows or directly affiliated with the program. And just uh, stick a quick note in the chat box, and I'll make sure that I forward that to you as well. Um, I think we'll just take a moment to, we, we will kind of expend just a couple of minutes in case anyone has a question uh, for Rob or a, a comment that they'd like to make. Uh, and we'll give you that opportunity now before we transition over to the case presentation. Any questions? I'm gonna just make one additional comment because again, I, I, I briefly referenced uh, my mom's journey with Alzheimer's, and you'd commented, uh, we talked a little bit about environmental uh, issues, but one of the other things that you'd mentioned that I found personally is so important was um, uh, adapting to the patient's frame of reference as opposed to trying to continue to orient them to reality. Mm -hmm. And the, the story I often tell is that when my mom was still verbal and, and conversational, uh, a common question she would ask, she would, first of all, lament that when she moved uh, into her uh, uh, independent living and then subsequent uh, you know, assisted and skilled, uh, you know, she, she was no longer driving. She was in a different city and didn't have a car. And she would often ask the question, what kind of car should I get next? And my sisters, with, with every wonderful good intent, would say, oh, mom, you know that you can't drive anymore. You know, you're in a new city. It's just not safe, you know. And she would go through all the rationale, and mom would be dejected. Mm -hmm. And you could see that that sorrow then persisted for some period of time after that conversation. When she asked me that question, I responded by, well, what kind of car would you like? Mm -hmm. And she would say, I think I'd look really good in a red convertible. <laughs> And I think, I think you'd look stunning in a red convertible. Perhaps when the weather changes, we can go out and see what kind of red convertibles are out there. Well, she was, she was happy because, so I was her favorite kid. <laughs> so, um, because, you know, we, we were trying to adapt to her reality. And I just think that's a really important uh, 
Yeah, and that's key, I think, for, for the folks who have more of the advanced dementia as well to live in their moment um, and then try to continue to try to reorient them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you all. Uh, we will go ahead and uh, shift over to the case presentation. Dr. Kim, I have you on board. Is that your expectation as well? 